Okay, our topic tonight is who has the priesthood? Tonight we want to compare the LDS priesthood claims with priesthood as presented in the Bible. Mormonism claims to be the only true church with the only authority to act in God's name. In the sixth article of faith of the LDS Church we read, we believe in the same organization that existed in the primitive church, viz. apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, etc. And that's in the back of their Pearl of Great Price, one of their books of scripture. The LDS Church believes that God removed priesthood authority from the earth shortly after the death of Christ's apostles. In the Encyclopedia of Britannica, uh, Britannica, in the Encyclopedia of Mormonism, we read, LDS rejection of most post-biblical Christianity is based on belief in an ancient apostasy. Apostolic authority ceased just after the New Testament period, and without apostolic leadership and authority, the church was soon overwhelmed by alien intellectual and cultural pressures, end of quote. But one wonders how the early church could go astray so quickly and priesthood be lost. According to Joseph Smith, four of Christ's disciples did not die but have been left on the earth to do missionary work. These include the Apostle John and three Book of Mormon disciples. According to the Doctrine and Covenants, section 7, John the Apostle was transformed and Jesus left him on earth to do evangelism. Joseph Smith claimed to receive by revelation the following information about John. That's okay. Quoting from the Doctrine and Covenants, section 7, verses 1 through 3. And the Lord said unto me, John, my beloved, what desirest thou? And I said unto him, Lord, give unto me power over death, that I may live and bring souls unto thee. And the Lord said unto me, verily, verily, I say unto thee, because thou desirest this, thou shalt tarry until I come in my glory and shall prophesy before nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. I might mention it doesn't sound like this would be done in secret, right? It sounds like we would know about this. But he's going to be in front of nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. Evidently, Joseph Smith misinterpreted John 21, 20 through 23, and you can go read that about uh, the discussion of whether or not John was going to stay on the earth. Uh, Jesus didn't say in that section that John would remain alive, but merely pointed out to Peter that John's future mission was not Peter's concern. But Joseph Smith took it and interpreted it to mean John would be left on earth. Besides this, the Book of Mormon also teaches that three Nephites, Jesus' disciples in the New World, did not taste of death, but were transformed and would remain on earth to do evangelism. And you can read about that in the Book of Mormon in 3 Nephi chapter 28. Again, raising the question of how could the church go into apostasy? LDS apostle Jeffrey Holland explained the role of the three Nephites in our day. These three Nephites continue in their translated state today, just as when they went throughout the lands of Nephi. They are yet ministering to Jew, Gentile, and the scattered tribes of Israel, even all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people, end of quote. How could there have been a total apostasy, as asserted by the LDS Church, if there have been four apostles on the earth since the time of Christ? Why wouldn't they have been able to ordain future apostles and keep the church from falling into a total apostasy? And where are the reports of their ministries? I've been told that, well, uh, things got so bad here that God uh, kind of took them out of the scene. Uh, and I'm thinking, well, didn't God know that at the time he told them they would live till he came back? Uh, it just seems to make God a little short-sighted. Anyways, uh, Jeffrey Holland thinks they're still out there preaching. 
So let's examine a few of the specific offices of the LDS priesthood. Next one. The LDS church priesthood is divided into two groups, Aaronic and Melchizedek. The chart on the screen shows the way the offices are broken down. And so the Melchizedek priesthood has the offices of prophet, apostle, 70, patriarch, high priest, and elder. And if you were uh, being ordained into the Melchizedek priesthood, your, first, your entry level would be as an elder at 18 or older. And then usually by the time you get to be middle-aged, you might be advanced to be a high priest. Each stake has a patriarch. And 70s used to be on the local level, but uh, a few years ago, uh, they, uh, I don't know if they issued revelations on this stuff, but anyways, they changed it to where we don't have 70s in the local wards anymore. Uh, now they have 70s in the top leadership of the church. And then you have the 12 apostles, plus the prophet and the two apostles that serve him as counselors. And then when we look at the Aaronic priesthood, we have Bishop, who is a presiding high priest, so he also has the Melchizedek priesthood. And there's one bishop in each ward. He's the, uh, like, pastor. Uh, then there are three offices for the teenage boys, deacon at 12, teacher at 14, and priest at 16. And then if the kid's going to go on a mission, he's made an elder at 18. I might interject here that this division is a recent development in Mormonism. I'm not sure just when they made the change of going to teenage boys, but when Mormonism started, these were all adult offices. They weren't teenage. It was not set up to be teenagers. It was set up to be all adults. Since the LDS Church makes a specific claim that their priesthood is the same as in the Bible, we need to compare their offices with those mentioned in Scripture. First, we'll look at the Old Testament priesthood and then the authority in the New Testament. So we'll look first at the Aaronic priesthood. Prior to the law of Moses, men such as Abraham offered sacrifices to God, but not as part of any priesthood. When God set up the priesthood in the days of Moses, he restricted it to Aaron and his adult descendants who were of the tribe of Levi. And if you want to look at that further, it's Numbers 3, 1 through 10, Numbers 8, 5 through 22, and Exodus 38, 21. This would disqualify most Mormons as they do not claim to be descended from Aaron. Many of them believe they are from the tribe of Ephraim but this would not make them eligible for the Aaronic priesthood. Now this gets us back to that position uh, in the Melchizedek priesthood where it says they have a patriarch in every stake. The patriarch gives you a blessing and in your blessing, uh, it, it declares what your lineage is, or at least for a lot of people. I don't know how many get a de declaration of lineage these days, but my patriarchal blessing told me I was from Ephraim. And I think that everyone I know in my immediate circle would all have been from Ephraim. I know once in a while, if it's a Jewish person, they might be told they're from Benjamin. If you're um, American Indian, you'll be told you're from Manasseh. Uh, but generally, they tell you you're from Ephraim, which disqualifies you from priesthood. <laughs> Even Jesus could not hold the Aaronic priesthood because he descended from the tribe of Judah. Hebrews 7.14 explains, For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. There were only two offices in the Aaronic priesthood, priests and one high priest. The priests prepared and offered the daily sacrifices in first the tabernacle and then later in the temple. The high priest was the only one allowed into the Holy of Holies, which he did once a year on the Day of Atonement to offer sacrifice for the sins of the people of Israel. The priesthood of the Old Testament was brought to an end with the death of Christ. Number three. In Hebrews 7, 11 through 12, we read, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? 
For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Also in Matthew 27, we read that the veil of the temple, which closed off the Holy of Holies, was split in two at the time of Christ's death, thus showing that the way into the presence of God no longer required the Jewish priesthood system with its animal sacrifices, since Christ himself was the Lamb of God offered for our sins, and he is now our only high priest. And we'll go back to the chart again. Looking at the ironic positions there of deacon, teacher, priest. Deacons. In Numbers 8, 23 through 25, God set the minimum age of the Aaronic priesthood at 25. <laughs> and there were only priests and one high priest. The Old Testament has no mention of deacons. The LDS Church ordains young men deacons their first office in the Aaronic priesthood at the age of 12. However, Paul instructed Timothy that deacons are to be mature men and faithful husbands, which doesn't seem to fit 12-year-old boys. And for that, you look at 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 12. Teachers. As part of the Aaronic priesthood in the LDS church, a young man is ordained a teacher at the age of 14. This office is separate from the assignment of teaching a class, such as Sunday school. The New Testament passages about teachers do not make them part of a special priesthood. Teachers should be mature Christians able to teach others, according to 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, not teenagers. And in fact, I think if you went back and read the uh, LDS Doctrine and Covenants sections on the different priesthood callings and duties of the priesthood, uh, of Aaronic priesthood holders, you could see that it was originally intended for all adults. The instructions for them don't fit 12 and 14 year old kids. Then they have the office of priest for the 16 year olds. <clears throat> in the LDS church, a young man is ordained a priest in the Aaronic priesthood at the age of 16 and does not need to be a descendant of Aaron. This was never done in the Old Testament. There are Jewish priests mentioned in the New Testament but an office of priest is never mentioned in the Christian church. And I think many times Mormons, when they read through the book of Acts, for instance, and they see uh, priests and high priests mentioned and the temple and those different things, they don't realize none of that has to do with the early Christian church. Well, the early uh, Jewish Christians met in the um, outer courts of the temple, but the Christians never had charge of the temple. Uh, they were not doing any kind of services in the building. They were just in the outskirts uh, around the temple. And they, uh, some priests converted to Christianity from Judaism, but in the Christian church itself, we see nothing of an office of authority where someone is labeled a priest. Then we look at the Melchizedek priesthood. Melchizedek is mentioned in Genesis 14, 17 through 20, as the king of Salem, which is Jerusalem, <clears throat> and a priest of God who blessed Abraham. In Psalms 110, 4, a promise was given that his priesthood would be forever. That promise was fulfilled in Jesus Christ, as indicated in chapters 5 through 7 of the book of Hebrews, where Melchizedek is identified as a type of Christ. Hebrews 5.10 tells us that Christ is the only high priest, quote, after the order of Melchizedek. Then in Hebrews 7, we read that there were many high priests due to death, but Jesus had a superior priesthood because his continues due to his endless life, and he is the only high priest in the early Christian church. Number five. In Hebrews 7, 26 through 27, we read, For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. The only Christian priesthood mentioned in the New Testament is the spiritual priesthood of every believer. Next, P. 
Peter wrote in 1 Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Notice that men are not singled out as the only ones holding this priesthood. It is for every Christian and is referred to often as the priesthood of all believers. Now we come to elders and bishops. In Mormonism, a man is ordained an elder upon entering the Melchizedek priesthood. <clears throat> While the New Testament mentions elders, in, uh, for instance, Acts 14.23, Titus 1.5-6, 1, 1 Peter 5.1-3, they are never referred to as a part of a priesthood system. In 1 Timothy 3.1 and Titus 1.7, the word bishop that appears in the King James Version of the Bible, but the word simply means overseer or steward and is rendered in newer translations as, as uh, simply overseer or steward in newer versions of the Bible. Bishop is not a separate office in the books of Timothy and Titus, but a continuation of Paul's instructions about elders. When Paul gave instructions to Timothy about leadership, he did not mention anything about ordaining men to either the Aaronic or Melchizedek priesthoods. Instead, the emphasis was on choosing mature Christians. In 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, Paul wrote, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful, faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So that was the criteria, not a special ordination, but that they were faithful Christians with the ability to teach. Now we go to 70s. In the LDS Church, a 70 is a specific office in their Melchizedek priesthood. He is a type of missionary and overseer of a given area of the church. That's in DNC 107, verse 25, if you want to look it up. Joseph Smith evidently read about Christ sending out 70 men in Luke 10, 1. Some Bibles, by the way, say 72. <laughs> <clears throat> Anyways, uh, Joseph Smith turned this event <clears throat> into an ordination of men into a specific office of priesthood. The LDS Church has now expanded this to different quorums of 70. So they have the uh, seven presidents of 70, the first quorum of 70, the second quorum of 70, third, fourth, fifth. Uh, of, so they got all kinds of 70. And the 70 doesn't have to be 70 people. I mean, just they call it 70, but you don't have to have 70 people. <clears throat> which I kind, kind of odd, but anyways. If you've got to have 12 apostles, why don't you have to have 70 70s? I don't get this. However, there is no mention in the New Testament of anyone ever being appointed to be a replacement of any of these 70 men. Surely if such an office was to be part of the church, it would have been mentioned in Acts or the other letters in the New Testament. Now looking at high priest. While there are thousands of high priests in the LDS church, there was only one Jewish high priest at a time. The high priest was part of the Aaronic priesthood. Hebrews 5.1 explains that the duties of the Jewish high priest were to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Mormon high priests do not offer any sacrifices, so they are not following the Old Testament pattern. The Jewish high priest served as an example and shadow of heavenly things, and we read about that in Hebrews chapter 8. <clears throat> Christ fulfilled this when he offered up himself, and you can read about that in Hebrews 7, through 27. He is the only high priest in the Christian church. Because Christ lives forever, his priesthood cannot pass to another. There are no references in the New Testament to any Christian holding the office of high priest. Now looking at pastors. I think this is, where are we at, number seven? <clears throat> Mormons will often use Ephesians 4.11 when trying to prove their system of priesthood. This verse reads, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. 
The LDS Church, however, does not have any pastors. One of their apostles, Joseph Fielding Smith, explained, the term pastor does not refer to an order in the priesthood like deacon, teacher, or priest. A bishop is a pastor, so is an elder who has charge of a branch, end of quote. But it seems strange that the Mormons insist the words apostles and teachers are specific offices of priesthood, but do not believe that pastor or evangelist are priesthood offices. So they just change the rules for whatever they want. So we look at evangelist or patriarch. Ephesians 4.11 mentions evangelists, yet there's no such office in the Mormon church. Instead, they claim that the original meaning has been lost and that evangelist is supposed to be patriarch. Joseph Fielding Smith explained, an evangelist is a patriarch. The patriarch to the church holds the keys of blessing for the members of the church. Now, we go to number eight, uh, Bruce McConkie. He wrote, having lost the true knowledge of priesthood and its offices, the false traditions of the sectarian world have applied the designation evangelist to traveling preachers, missionaries, and revivalists. Well, yes, <laughs> because that's what it means. <laughs> There is no evidence that the Greek word evangelist ever carried the meaning of patriarch. The Greek word translated evangelist carries the meaning of someone who proclaims the good news, not one who gives prayer blessings to church members. In the LDS church, a patriarch gives a blessing to a member as a sort of spiritual blueprint for his or her life, and you usually get that as a teenager in Mormonism. Next, we'll look at apostles and prophets. As Judas betrayed Christ, there was one man chosen to replace him as part of the 12 apostles. And you see Acts 1, 21 through 23. To qualify for this position, the person had to be an eyewitness to the full ministry of Jesus, including the resurrection. There is no evidence in the New Testament that anyone ever was chosen to replace one of the original 12 after the one that was picked in Acts 1. In Mormonism, the president of the church is considered a prophet and apostle. LDS apostle Bruce McConkie stated, apostles and prophets are the foundation upon which the organization of the true church rests. Now, number nine. In trying to establish the need for apostles and prophets in the church, Mormons appeal to 1 Corinthians 12:28. Now you are the body of Christ and individual members of it, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. However, if one reads the entire section from verses 27 to 31, it is obvious that Paul is discussing various ministries or gifts in the church, not listing specific priesthood offices. Otherwise, you'd have an office of helping, an office of administering, an office of various kinds of tongues. Notice also that Paul lists apostles first and prophets second. So he says he has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, and third teachers, which is all out of order for Mormon priesthood. Because in Mormonism, the prophet is the top of the ladder of priesthood offices, and the apostles serve under the prophet. And teachers are way down the line, clear down to the 14-year-old kids. Also in Mormonism, the office of teacher is bestowed on 14-year-old boys not a man, third in rank to the prophet and apostles. Another problem for the LDS position is the concept of having three apostles in its first presidency that oversee the 12 apostles. This adds up to 15 apostles and is not the same as Jesus' 12 apostles. 
They also maintain that Peter, James, and John were the first presidency of the early church. But they were part of the 12, not in addition to the 12. If Mormonism is going to insist that the church today must set up exactly as it was under Christ, then they have too many apostles. The Mormons cannot have it both ways. Either they are a restoration that is exactly like the New Testament church, or they are setting up something different from the early church. In the February 2004 Enzyme, LDS President Gordon B. Hinckley laid out the four cornerstones of Mormonism. The first is Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation. Second is Joseph Smith's first vision. Third is the Book of Mormon. And fourth is priesthood authority. The LDS Church claims that those holding its priesthood are the only ones recognized by God to perform baptisms and ordinances of the gospel. Mormonism rejects baptisms done by any other church. The LDS Manual Doctrines of the Gospel explains, what is the LDS priesthood? It is nothing more nor less than the power of God delegated to man by which man can act legitimately not assuming that authority, nor borrowing it from generations that are dead and gone. I find that quote a little odd. The last part of that, that we're not, they are not assuming that authority, nor borrowing it from generations that are dead and gone. Well, excuse me, uh, it looks to me like we got a hundred and some odd years here of uh, borrowing priesthood rights from the dead. <laughs> and relying on past ordination. So I don't see how they can separate themselves from uh, other churches that might claim to have some sort of uh, uh, priesthood passed down from person to person. That seems to be what they're doing. The LDS Church teaches that this authority must be acquired by proper means. In the doctrines of the gospel, we read that every priesthood act must be done quote, in the proper way and after the proper order. This raises the question as to whether or not Joseph and Oliver were baptized and ordained by proper priesthood authority in the, quote, proper way. Joseph Smith's account of the event is published in the Pearl of Great Price. In it, Joseph Smith relates that while working on the translation of the Book of Mormon in the May of 1829, he and Oliver Cowdery became concerned about baptism and went out into the woods to pray. Now this is a quote. Uh, this is Joseph Smith. While we were thus employed, praying and calling upon the Lord, a messenger from heaven descended in a cloud of light, and having laid his hands upon us, he ordained us, meaning Joseph and Oliver, saying, Upon you, my fellow servants, in the name of Messiah, I confer the priesthood of Aaron, which holds the keys of the ministrating of angels and the gospel of repentance and of baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. The next part I will post on the overhead, that's number 10, so it will be easier for you to follow the sequence of events. And this is continuing the quote from the back of the Pearl of Great Price. He said this ironic priesthood had not the power of laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost, but that this should be conferred on us hereafter. And he commanded us to go and be baptized and gave us directions that I should baptize Oliver Cowdery and that afterwards he should baptize me. Accordingly, we went and were baptized. I baptized him first and afterwards he baptized me after which I laid my hands on his head and ordained him to the Aaronic priesthood. And afterwards, he laid his hands on me and ordained me to the same priesthood. For so we were commanded. It was on the 15th day of May, 1829, that we were ordained under the hand of this messenger and baptized. How could the angel, elsewhere identified as John the Baptist, ordain them to the priesthood before they were baptized. According to LDS doctrine today, a man must be baptized by someone holding the LDS priesthood authority before he can be ordained to the priesthood. So you get into this whole circle of which came first, the baptism or the ordination. 
If John the Baptist's ordination at the beginning was valid, why did Joseph and Oliver need to baptize each other and then reordain each other to the same priesthood? Why wouldn't the angel baptize them first and then ordain them? Merle B. Bateman, one of the top leaders of the LDS Church, emphasized the necessity of restoring proper priesthood authority to Joseph Smith, quote, one of the remarkable evidences of the restoration is the testimony of Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery regarding the manner in which the priesthood and its directing powers were returned to earth. John the Baptist brought back the Aaronic priesthood with the keys of repentance and baptism Peter, James, and John restored not only the Melchizedek priesthood, but also the keys of the kingdom. Still going on a quote, in contrast, 19th century ministers in the Palmyra environs, not understanding the great apostasy that had taken place, believed in an entirely different process for priesthood reception. They believed that the power to preach came through an inner calling to a priesthood of believers. And that was in the Ensign for November 2003. If such keys were needed, why didn't Peter, James, and John restore both the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthood? Mormonism claims that, they held, that those three men held the authority for both priesthoods. So why would John the Baptist be needed at all? Well, I think it's because it's an afterthought. <laughs> He's just thought of... Uh, the Aaronic priesthood, and then he gets to thinking about the Melchizedek stuff later. If Peter, James, and John conferred the priesthood on Joseph and Oliver, when did it happen? Because they say, they give a specific date for the Aaronic priesthood, and then sometime after that, Peter, James, and John came. In his story printed at the back of the Pearl of Great Price, Joseph Smith stated that on May 15, 1829, the Aaronic priesthood was conferred upon him and Oliver Cowdery. While Smith is confident on the date for the Aaronic priesthood, there is no date given for his ordination to the Melchizedek priesthood. The history of the church by Joseph Smith shows that there is real confusion as to when Peter, James, and John supposedly appeared. The footnote on, pa footnote on page 61 of the history of the church states, before the 6th of April, 1830, and probably before that very month of June, 1829, had expired, Peter, James, and John had come and conferred upon Joseph and Oliver the keys of the Melchizedek priesthood. See, it's speculation as to the date. Today, the LDS Church maintains that after the spring of 1829, both priesthoods were functioning in the church. The Mormon church was established 1830, and the, by their claim, Joseph and his followers already had priesthood before they set up the church. However, the historical documents of the period do not show any such teaching. Historian D. Michael Quinn explained, a closer look at contemporary records indicates that men were first ordained to the higher priesthood over a year after the church's founding. No mention of angelic ordinations can be found in original documents until 1834 and 35. Thereafter, accounts of the visit of Peter, James, and John by Cowdery and Smith remained vague and contradictory. The earliest historical documents show that the concept of the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthoods were products of Joseph Smith's evolving theology and were not taught prior to 1831. This is important for their priesthood claims that they had to have before they founded the church. Mormonism maintains that when John the Baptist appeared to Smith and Cowdery in 1829, they received the Aaronic priesthood, which included the offices of deacon, teacher, and priest. When Peter, James, and John supposedly appeared a short while later, they conferred on Smith and Cowdery the Melchizedek priesthood, which included the offices of elder, 70, high priest, bishop, patriarch, apostle, and prophet. While one can find mention of such offices as elder or teacher in early LDS documents, these were not considered part of a larger priesthood system, such as Melchizedek or Aaronic. Smith seems to have initially used the designations of elders and teachers in much the same way that other churches of the day would have used those terms. 
The high priesthood was an addition. People reading the current edition of the Doctrine and Covenants assume that the revelations read the same as they were originally printed. However, there have been important revisions relating to priesthood. And these uh, next illustrations I'm going to be going through are areas that were a concern for me as a young person as I was studying the truth claims of Mormonism when I saw how Joseph Smith had rewritten his revelations to put in later teachings into an earlier time frame as though they were there at the beginning bothered me that it seemed uh, like a counterfeit. It wasn't telling the story as it really happened. He's doctoring the story. The first printing of Smith's revelations in book form was in 1833 in a work titled Book of Commandments. Later in 1835, a new edition was prepared, changing many of the original revelations and adding new ones. The title was also changed to Doctrine and Covenants. Chapter 24 of the 1833 Book of Commandments, this is the first book form of Joseph's Revelations, gave instructions about elders, priests, teachers, and deacons, but made no mention of two priesthoods. When this revelation was reprinted in the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants, which today is section 20, Dozens of words were added to the text to include such offices as high counselors, high priests, high priesthood. And slide 11. Okay, I realize that you cannot read that, but I wanted you to be able to see how the words written on the side of that all would have to be supplied into the text to have it read the same as a current Doctrine and Covenants. Now, if you want to see these uh, illustrations in a readable form <laughs> on our website at utlm.org, we have our book, Changing World of Mormonism, online. And there's a chapter in there on the changes in the revelations. And these illustrations are in there. And the photos are clear enough that you can read the words that have been supplied. And you can read the verses of uh, which sections and things that it came out of. When I saw how this uh, revelation had been altered, it was very disturbing to my confidence in Joseph Smith's um, call from God. We're not dealing with translation of foreign languages. We're talking about English. If God's speaking to Joseph Smith in English, we assume that his scribe can record it accurately. And I assume that the creator of the universe would know a couple of years ahead of time what he wanted the church to be doing. I don't see why you would have to go two years later and redo the revelations between the 33 printing and the 1835 editions. Okay, let's go to the next one, illustration. And this doesn't get any better as far as your ability to read it, but you get a, a sense for how much text had to be added in to that section. Um, part of the wording that's been added into these two different sections are uh, wording about priesthood, amongst other things. But in this particular one where you have the big section <clears throat> that goes down the side and then around onto the bottom, part of what it says down there that was added in was... Um, the story about Peter, James, and John appearing to Joseph Smith. So towards the bottom it says, And also with Peter and James and John, whom I have sent unto you, by whom I have ordained you and confirmed you to be apostles and a special witnesses of my name. And then it goes on further to talk about the keys of my kingdom. So he's trying to backdate into earlier revelations concepts about priesthood, there were not there at the time of the dating of the actual revelation. But as Mormonism moves um, from Independence, Missouri, where the Book of Commandments was printed, and they go to Kirtland, uh, where they do the 1835 DNC, they're getting new converts, they're losing some of the earlier converts, 
A lot of people coming into the church at that time would have not seen the 1833 Book of Commandments and would not have been aware that the changes had even been made. LDS historian Gregory A. Prince wrote, although in the Mormon church today, the term priesthood refers to this bestowed authority, such a relationship did not develop until years after the founding of the church. Initially, authority was understood to be inherent in the terms offices. Three offices, elder, priest, and teacher were present by August of 29, as were the ordinances of baptism, confirmation, and ordination. But the word priesthood was not used in reference to these for another three years. Mr. Prince goes on to explain that while the Book of Mormon contains references to high authority, they were not understood in terms of priesthood. He concluded, it was not until several months after the June 1831 General Conference when the high priesthood was conferred that the term priesthood entered Mormon usage at all. And uh, that's from his book, Power from on High, the Development of Mormon Priesthood. And if you wanted to read more on how this all came about and was expanded through the years, uh, Mr. Prince's book is one of the uh, major books covering that topic. Thus, we see that at the time of the founding of Mormonism in 1830, there was no teaching or awareness of Joseph Smith claiming to have received either the Aaronic priesthood or the Melchizedek priesthood in 1829. Another example of changing revelations to include Melchizedek and Aaronic priesthood information is seen by comparing Smith's 1831 revelation, which was printed in the 1832 church newspaper, Evening and Morning Star, and compare it with the current version of the Doctrine and Covenants, section 68. And this is uh, slide 13. So again, you see all of the words written down the side that have to be supplied into the written text to have it read like a current doctrine and covenants. On the big edition on the one side, some of the words that were added in are the words, the first presidency of the Melchizedek priesthood, uh, later on, high priest of the Melchizedek priesthood, authority to officiate, uh, lesser offices, uh, bishops, literal descendant of Aaron, Melchizedek priesthood mentioned again. Uh, the presidency of the church is mentioned. So you get these different concepts being pushed back into an earlier time frame. Also sections two and 13 of the current Doctrine and Covenants, which mention priesthood, were not printed in the 1833 Book of Commandments. They were extracted from Joseph Smith's history, which wasn't started until 1838, and were not added to the Doctrine of Covenants until 1876. So even in the early days of Mormonism, there would have been revelations you wouldn't even have seen that came in later. So we see this evolving of priesthood concepts over many years. As Joseph Smith's church began to grow, so did the need for clearer delineation of authority. Thus, the backdating and insertion of priesthood claims into the revelations. David Whitmer, one of the witnesses to the Book of Mormon, related the following concerning those additions. And remember, David Whitmer was in the room when many of the early revelations were dictated. Quote, authority is the word we used for the first two years in the church. This matter of two orders of priesthood in the Church of Christ and lineal priesthood of the old law being in the church all originated in the mind of Sidney Rigdon. This is the way the high priest and the priesthood as you have it was introduced into the Church of Christ almost two years after its beginning and after we had already baptized and confirmed about 2,000 souls into the church. And that's in a little pamphlet called An Address to All Believers in Christ that David Whitmer wrote in 1887. I find it interesting, uh, Mormons will often refer to the uh, testimony of the three witnesses that they always believed the Book of Mormon, and they like to say David Whitmer, even though he didn't come back to the church after he apostatized, he always maintained his belief in the Book of Mormon. 
And then I like to remind them, yes, well, he said a lot of other things uh, other than he believed the Book of Mormon. He also said Joseph Smith was a fallen prophet and invented the whole priesthood concept. <laughs> uh, but they don't read his whole statement. They only read the little paragraph, the sentence that they like, and ignore the rest. Whitmer also condemned the LDS leaders for endorsing the rewriting of Smith's revelations between their first printing in the Book of Commandments in 1833 and the second printing in the Doctrine and Covenants in 1835. Whitmer wrote, you have changed the revelations from the way they were first given and as they are today to support the error of Brother Joseph in taking upon himself the office of seer to the church. You have changed the revelations to support the error of high priests. You have changed the revelations to support the error of a president of the high priesthood, high counselors, etc. That's on page 49 of his address. In recent years, the LDS Church has been more open about the textual revisions in Smith's revelations. Yet they continue to insist that the priesthood was restored in 1829. And in fact, you will find uh, a difference between what is said in General Conference and what the Mormon historians put up on the Joseph Smith Papers Project. Uh, the Mormon historians are all aware of the changes and problems with the claims for restoration of priesthood. But the general authorities continue to say in conference that the, the storyline is absolute. Joseph got, and Oliver got the priesthood in 29. They started the church in 1830, and these were established positions in the church from 29 forward. If the Melchizedek and Aaronic priesthoods were known and used prior to the printing of the 1833 Book of Commandments, it certainly seems strange that it contains no such teaching. So the church has been going three years when they print the Book of Commandments. It should have had that material in it. Researcher Lamar Peterson concluded, there seems to be no support for the historicity of the restoration of the priesthood in journals, diaries, letters, nor printed matter prior to October 1834. In conclusion, thus we see that beside the problem that Mormon priesthood concepts are not in accord with the New Testament, the lack of historical references in early LDS documents to priesthood restoration leaves us with no reason to accept the Mormon claim of priesthood authority. While Mormons insist that there needs to be a prophet at the head of the church, they seem to ignore the New Testament warnings of false prophets. Matthew 24, 24 warns, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive if possible even the elect. We should test those that claim to be prophets. In 1 John 4, 1, we are counseled, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. If the LDS people want to truly follow the New Testament model, they will need to renounce their claims to Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthood and embrace the priesthood of all believers. And number 14. In 1 Peter 2, 4 through 5, we read, As you come to him, meaning Jesus, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Christians everywhere look to Jesus' death and resurrection as the atonement for our sins, trusting Christ alone for eternal life, and thus becoming part of his holy priesthood. Thank you. At this time, we'll have a brief period of question and answer. Uh, I would ask you just a moment or two thought to what your question is so that you can word it as clearly and succinctly as possible. Raise your hand, I'd be happy to bring the microphone, and Sandra, if you'd like to sit down, please. Well, I won't have that mic, so I think I have to stand here. <laughs> I'll have to, so go ahead, I'm okay. If you're okay, we're good. Well, they so, got cameras uh, set up too. <laughs> no, we're good, okay, go ahead. Sorry for the interruption. Questions and answers, uh, 
Give a few moments to answer your question. Raise your hand. I'll be happy to bring you a microphone. Hi, Sandra. Um, what uh, what sort of uh, impact? I'm, I'm guessing that uh, Peter Whitmer's pamphlet had a David Whitmer. David Whitmer. Yeah. No, right, right from the beginning. When uh, Gerald um, was a rebellious teen, his bishop started hinting it was time for him to consider straightening up and going on a mission. And he um, read the uh, encyclopedia article on Mormonism and found that it mentioned splinter groups of Mormonism. He didn't know there were any other kind of Mormons. And then he found out about the reorganized LDS church, and so he went over there to see what they were about, and the pastor started telling him everything that was wrong with Brigham Young and how he needed to scuttle all that and just go back to Joseph Smith. Well, while he was visiting at the reorganized church, he met a barber who had a barber shop downtown called James Wardle. And at the back of Mr. Wardle's barber shop, was a huge collection of all the early printings of uh, early Mormon books. And he had probably one of the largest private collections of rare Mormon books in the state. And uh, Gerald went down to his barbershop to see his collection and James Wardle gave him a copy of David Whitmer's pamphlet and said, you, in your spiritual journey, <laughs> you need to read David Whitmer's pamphlet and consider what he said about the origins of how the church developed. And when Gerald read that, and Whitmer talks about the changes in the different sections of the Doctrine of Covenants, uh, Gerald was furious. They were sure that Whitmer must be lying. So he thought, well, someone ought to expose this. If Whitmer's making this all up, there ought to be something done about this. Uh, but he wanted to see the originals, and so he got in his jalopy and <laughs> drove across Kansas and went to Independence, Missouri, not knowing anybody, and visited around the, the different splinter groups. And while he was there, he went to the uh, Church of Christ Temple Lot group, and they showed him an original book of commandments. And so that verified David Whitmer's statement that the revelations, in fact, had been changed. And that started Gerald on his journey of uh, studying the early documents, find out what all had been changed, uh, why had things been changed, why was the church covering up what had been changed. So that when I met him, he uh, very early on showed me Whitmer's pamphlet <laughs> that, to show me that these revelations had been changed. And because of that, I went down to uh, Sam Weller's bookstore uh, that's now run by the, grandpa, uh, the grandson of the guy that first opened the bookstore, and uh, went in there and bought a reprint of the 1833 Book of Commandments and a current Doctrine and Covenants. And I took it home and got my grandma to read it with me. I sat with the current DNC and my grandma with the 33 Book of Commandments, and we went through the whole Book of Commandments, and I marked in my DNC in the margins uh, where I could, if it was just a few words, I wrote them in. If it was a big section like we saw in these illustrations, I had to just write on the side, uh, see such and such page of the uh, Book of Commandments, because it was too big to write in. And going through those was a very disillusioning experience that uh, the creator of the universe surely could have said the revelations right. Why would he need to go back two years or three years later and revise them? But all of that study came out of seeing David Whitmer's pamphlet and rising to the challenge of, is he telling the truth? I can check this out. Um, and then at that time when we did our study, <laughs> back in 1959 in the Dark Ages, the libraries were just getting photocopies into the libraries at that time. <laughs> they did have microfilms, but uh, to, to walk in and get a 10 cent photocopy wasn't happening. Uh, but I went up to the University of Utah Special Collections and saw different photo reprints of the original books, in some cases the original books, um, and that launched us in, into our whole journey. So Whitmer was a big factor in how we got started in our research. Anyone else?
This is all very complicated. Yes. Could you try to, to summarize the timeline again and brief of the priesthood developments? Well, it's very confusing. Uh, <laughs> Supposedly in 29, 1829, uh, the year before he, Smith founds his church, John the Baptist comes and gives the Aaronic priesthood, and the next month, whatever, whenever, Peter, James, and John come. But there's no recorded church documents that talk about this early on. In 1831, you start to get language in the writings about um, some kind of authority, but it's not Melchizedek Aaronic yet. That doesn't develop until 34 and 35. So through the 29 to 1835 time period, you will find bits and pieces of language relating to priesthood, but it is not Melchizedek Aaronic yet. And so you, you have to follow through how this changes in the different diaries, church manuscripts, and uh, printed revelations as this evolves. And, that, and the church historians concede that there's nothing before 1831 about priesthood. Uh, and there, and it, but at 31, it's just vague about priesthood. It's not Aaronic Melchizedek yet. It's high priesthood, but it's not identified yet. And this whole idea of Peter, James, and John is a later thing that's plugged back into the revelations in the Book of Commandments. Um, so it's a very complicated story. And unless you sat down and read all the different documents and reference these things, uh, it's hard to follow it through. On the Mormon website of uh, Joseph Smith's um, papers, they have a... Uh, uh, I don't remember what the section's called, but they have a flow chart or, or statements on priesthood. But they minimize the importance of the differences, but they do list the different documents, but the wording they have as they introduce the different documents uh, you, keeps you from seeing how big a problem it is. Uh, but they do at least list the different documents on there. But the historians concede the problem. It's just the church conference people that haven't got the memo. So. Yeah. Sandra? Yeah. My name is Jeff. Uh, doesn't the church believe that the only way to feel the Holy Ghost is to have it given to you by someone like the priesthood? That you have to have it given yes. to you? Yes, well, they say that you can be influenced by the Holy Spirit but you do not have the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit until you have had baptism and hands laid on you to confer the Holy Spirit on you. So they have a sort of halfway availability of the Spirit to the unbeliever, but you don't get the full power until the church officially lays hands on you and bestows the Holy Spirit on you. Anyone else? Upper front. Sandra, briefly. Uh, yeah, yeah, just hold it. Briefly. Uh, how does the Christian uh, church? It's not going through yet. It's, uh, it's a matter of how you hold it, it shorts. <laughs> Oh. My big voice. Okay. okay. Uh, how, do, how do you explain that there was no apostasy when the disciples all were scattered throughout Asia Minor and not that they took the word with them? How could it have been changed? Right. Every single one of the, the manuscripts. Well, we had, right. That's a big problem on uh, their claim for apostasy. We have the New Testament uh, books uh, by um, 100 AD. They aren't compiled together as a Bible, but I mean, they're circulating around amongst the churches. 
And so if you're going to make the apostasy happen after uh, the death of the apostles, uh, you don't have time for a corruption of the text to happen before then and when we have today copies of the New Testament that date back into like 150 AD or something, you know, so, so when's this time period? You only got like 50, 60 years here to make this big revision of everything and, and there's no reason to assume it. Uh, we have part of the uh, book of John, uh, John uh, chapter 17 or 18, in a manuscript from 130 AD. And it reads the same as today. We have part, uh, we have John 1, 1 in a manuscript of 180 AD. And it reads the same as it does today. There's no reason to assume that the scriptures got changed. There was no one church in control, no one man in control of all the manuscripts that were being passed around to the churches around the Mediterranean. And as they find the different manuscripts that have been preserved around the Mediterranean, lo and behold, they all got the same gospel in them. It's the same thing. There's n nothing shows up to surprise us that suddenly we encounter something that sounds like Mormonism. You don't get this Aaronic Melchizedek priesthood temple marriage stuff in anything. And so if I'm free to just say what was in the written record that got lost, we could make up anything we wanted. I mean, I could just say, well, you know, of course, the part that got uh, thrown away was the prophecy that in the last days there would be a prophet named Joseph Smith and to watch out for him. And no one knew who that was, so they just discarded that part. I, I mean, if you're going to say parts were discarded, you can't just invent what got thrown away. <laughs> there has to be some reason to assume that anything was changed, and there just simply is nothing there. The oldest manuscripts... The church fathers all are quoting the same scriptures we have today. We certainly have time for one or two more. Liberal Mormons are really excited about uh, potential for feminine priesthood stuff. What's the historical case that they're making? Is, is, it, is it exciting for them? <laughs> Okay, uh, Mormon priesthood for women. Um, well, uh, a few years ago, uh, D. Michael Quinn, historian, uh, wrote an article speculating that when women were participating in the temple rituals in Nauvoo, that they were in fact acting as priestesses and with priesthood. And so the feminists all look to the Nauvoo temple experience to say that Joseph was giving priesthood to women because the women did the washing and anointing of other women, which is a priesthood function, which makes a problem for the Mormons today on their priesthood just being a priesthood of men. How did the women get to do priesthood ordinations of the women in the washing and anointing ceremonies? Uh, so because of that, uh, some, like Quinn, have speculated that Joseph was giving priesthood to women. But it never got developed. If the Mormons wanted to try to develop a priesthood for women, I suppose they could enlarge on the role of the temple ritual um, or bring back the women's ability to ordain and bless the sick. But I don't think they're ever going to make a move to make them Aaronic Melchizedek priesthood holders. I think that's a move too far. Uh, Mormonism is patriarchy. Their whole eternal uh, exaltation is based on patriarchy. The Father, Son, Holy Ghost are the three gods in charge of our world. The Mother God doesn't hardly get any press. And although the feminists might like the idea of God having a wife, I don't think they'd want the wife that Mormonism presents because her role seems to be only that of having children for her husband to have more worlds. She, so well, you could make having babies part of a priesthood role or something, but <laughs> it still means 20 billion spirit babies. <laughs> uh, so I think they've got a real problem on the one hand of wanting to elevate the women's position, but it doesn't really fit into their patriarchy 
So I don't see an easy transition on that. They can invent some kind of priesthood for them, maybe in relation to the temple ritual. They can throw a few bones out to them by letting the women be a part of the blessing circle of naming a baby. Um, they can be a part of a priesthood circle to pray for the sick or something, anointing or something that way. But I don't see them ever putting them into the Aaronic Melchizedek priesthood. Over here, Sandra. Hmm? Oh, over here. Okay. <laughs> um, it mentions in Matthew about the keys of the kingdom. <laughs> cut, cut out. <laughs> keys of the kingdom. So I was wondering if you could just explain how, how that fits into... Keys just, the keys just mean authority. It it's, doesn't make it a priesthood office. God authorizes people to speak in his name. He authorized the apostles to go out and preach in his name. But there was, it's not part of a system of hierarchical priesthood. They've imposed that onto it, and they make keys become some special thing. It just means um, giving someone power or authority, uh, God's approval. 